evening out there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another episode of Empire State of Baseball. This is one of your four hosts, Corey Fats, here today with Rich, Tom, and Joe. This is episode number 37, Monday, February 27th of the year 2023. We are airing exclusively on Twitch and powered by StreamYard. Well, gentlemen, here we are once again, another off-season series edition of Empire State of Baseball. We got a big show today. We're going to run through some MLB off-season report cards, talk about some latest signings that's happened across the league, spring training's underway. Tom, we'll start with you. Tom, how are you feeling today on this fine evening? Feeling good. Just uh, living the, the paternity leave life right now. So my days are full of trying to make my child eat, uh, eat a bottle and to not yell at me. So that's kind of that's where my life is currently. Uh, yeah, and it's been a while since we've seen Mr. Thomas on the show. I think since like the first week of December. It's been a very long time since we've Sounds seen Thomas. Right. Sounds about right. Sounds about right. A whole new studio, hopefully hitting half them bottles in this cold winter weather. And uh, looking <laughs> I mean, good, man. Depending on depending on what kind of nonsense Joe brings up, you know, throughout the the season, these bottles might disappear <laughs> just just from the. <laughs> The stupidity that comes out of his mouth. Oh, oh, Joe, man. preseason baseball is back, my friend. How you feeling? Oh, it's great. It you know this is always the last two weeks are always between the Super Bowl and and the start of spring training are the, uh, the toughest sports weeks of the year. Um, it's offset this year a little bit. My Devils are finally making moves and doing some good, uh, but it it it's tough to get through these every day. Uh, so it's good to have baseball back, you know, e- even if it's only a couple times a week with spring training, um, you know, it, it's it feels like an old friend is uh, has come back from his vacation. Tom already had enough. So he's gone. He already <laughs> had enough. He was only two minutes into his return in 2023. He's gone. Yep. Uh, that's it. Corey, yeah. Uh, spring, spring training baseball is back and uh I, I couldn't be more excited to to have baseball back and uh, joe you you've made that comparison before many a times it's it's the friend that uh you haven't seen in a while you'd certainly miss it what i love about about this season is not only you're bringing back uh the, the greatest sport known to man but it's also you're bringing you're, you're ringing in great weather and that's what we need right now we had some teases throughout this past winter it's, we had a full spring in january and early february now we're looking back. It's currently sleeting right outside the studio right now. Uh, so I'm looking forward to some good weather once again. 100%. I can't wait for this weather to get warmer again. We did have a tease, like you said, and all of a sudden I'm looking at the weather now, and we're about to hit March, and the next two weeks it's not even going to hit 50. We're supposed to be in the mid-40s for the next two weeks. So uh, hopefully it doesn't get much colder than that. I'm ready to go. I'm ready for April. I want to get this season started. I actually start a little early this year. Last week of March, I think it's the 30th of March, where – uh, everyone gets going on a Thursday night. So I'm looking forward to it. Again, spring training's here. Love watching them on TV. Those early early days, too, right before the World Baseball Classic. Uh, mm-hmm. Getting a quick look at your guys before they start to leave away. Mets especially have a ton of guys in the WBC this year. So uh, good to see a guy like Lindor, Alonzo looking slim coming off uh, this uh, offseason right here. So good to see the guys back together again until they depart for WBC. But then you get a good look at some of the guys who – may not make the team, some of the young kids, the prospects. Uh, so it's still something good to look forward to when the, the stars leave for the WBC. Yeah, and the WBC almost a week away. We're going to cover the World Baseball Classic at length in a couple of weeks' time when we uh, we touch more on that tournament. Uh, Joe, uh, before we get into our show today, we have a few viewers already on Twitch. What's the best way for them to tell their buddies about our stream tonight? Yeah, you can go uh, to the App Store, download Twitch on your smartphone, and subscribe to Empire State of Baseball. The link is in our bio at ESB Podcast. You can share uh, when we and hit the notification button. You will get a notification instantly when we go live. Of course. So uh, hopefully we'll see a few more viewers come in and trickle in as uh, we are back underway with the uh, the off-season edition of our show. We're still not on season yet because it's not the 23 regular season yet, but we're we're closing on it. But we are going to have a bunch of announcements later on tonight uh, in regards to some future episodes and what to expect. We got a lot of fun things lined up. Uh, so you guys want to stay tuned for later on 
uh, for tonight's show. But we're going to get things going with the state of baseball, starting with the San Diego Padres. And the Padres have had a critically acclaimed offseason at best here uh, with a couple insane signings. And, of course, now Manny Machado throwing this little puppy out there right before games kind of got underway. But Manny Machado was a subject of, well, he's going to absolutely opt out of his contract. He was an MVP finalist last year. Uh, but the the uh, the Padres were able to uh, to find a way to get Machado to stay put in the brown and yellow pinstripes, really gross pinstripes, that is. It, but in beautiful weather, San Diego, Manny Machado staying put for 11 years for the Padres. Tom, what do you think of this deal for San Diego? I mean, good for them. I I, I really liked. Uh, I know Machado had set a deadline as of whatever it was. It was I think it was like a week ago, and it passed. And then this was one of the first times a player said they get these day de- these deadlines we put in are kind of bo- like BS. And they he's like, oh, I'll just sign it after. So like that. Um, but good for them. I mean, we're we're gonna you know not to tease too much of our what's coming up, but we we rank mm-hmm. each position. Uh, for each position throughout MLB. And Machado is definitely at the top of, you know, towards the top of everyone's third base rankings. Um, he's a he's a great player. Um, yeah, I mean, good deal for them. I know we're going to kind of talk about how much they're spending on him and how that's possible uh, because it, it does seem like a, a ton of money being spent in what is yeah. considered a small market in, in baseball. So um, I don't know who wants to talk about that a little bit about, like, how do we think – the Padres are doing this. Yeah, it's it, yeah. That, that's it's, a very yeah. good question. It's a, it's a good question. The Padres have never been uh, at this level of spending in their entire franchise history. They have brief bouts where they become a top team and then they spend for a year or two and then they go away. Um, so now we're going to have three contracts under uh, over ten years and over. Um, you know, three hundred million dollars in value. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure if Bogarts got to the three hundred, but you have Bogarts, Machado, and uh, uh, Fernando Tatis who are locked in for at least ten years apiece. Um, you know, this team is in win now mode. Uh, you Darvish got another six years on his deal. Um, I don't know if there's gonna be room for Soto. At this particular point in time, in my personal opinion, I would probably try to make the play for Soto and let Manny walk. Um, But I think they kind of decided, hey, Manny's been here. We know what he's capable of. We're going to give him the money, and then we're going to worry about the last four or five years on the back end. Um, But they are, make no mistake, in win-now mode because the Padres in five years from now are going to have two aging superstars on their infield um, that are probably not going to be close to the level of production they are now. So mm-hmm. the Padres are all in. I think it's great for the game of baseball. Um, it it's, it kind of stinks. We, we don't get to see the free agency frenzy surrounding Machado at the end of the year. But at the same time, I think it's great for the uh, game of baseball. I think they sense weakness from the Dodgers, especially this year after this offseason. I think they're trying to do everything in their power to win a World Series within the next three to four years. Yes. Yeah. Yes, 100%. they are. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been I'll a while. Say the, uh, the, the other way it's possible is that all these owners are super rich and they can afford all this. And whenever I know we are fans of teams that spend a lot of money and they play mm-hmm. in you know the biggest market and, and all of that, but – if you're a fan out there of, of the, the Orioles or the Reds or, or the Twins, hey, your owner has a ton of money, mm-hmm. and they can spend it on these guys. Like, the Padres are, are proving that. And especially if you look at how packed that stadium is, like, they're bringing in so much money because the team's exciting. People want to go. Um, I just hope this is, like, a, a – a, a, blueprint for some of these other teams that just they they, they mm-hmm. put out this bs that they they have no money and we can't compete oh look, look at the Padres are doing they're they're competing with with the dodgers right up the the road there and um you know frankly outspending them at this point they're utilizing yeah. the resources you you gotta just tip your, your your cap to them that that's what you have to do uh now Corey, i'll direct this one to you with machado uh we, we did a we did an episode back in december where the mets came close to uh Penning, Carlos Correa to be their everyday third baseman. So now it's a, it's a position, a question where you obviously had Eduardo Escobar in the mix and uh, 
Brett Beatty and some of the other prospects. Uh, and many Met fans were thinking, all right, well, we're going to be in the mix of her Machado. So now how does it feel knowing that Machado's off the market uh, it, it, from, from a Met fan perspective? Well, I'll tell you what, when, when the Correa deal fell through and I'm thinking about, okay, who could be the third baseman of the future? The very first thing that came to mind was, oh, could Brett Beatty maybe take over that role at third base? And so far, uh, listen, he had a nice home run the other day in spring training. So hopefully to see a little more of Beatty this uh, spring training. But uh, Machado was probably the next big ticket guy that you think could be that option at the position. You look at the numbers. I mean, we talk about the Padres financially. Right across town, you know, right across the country, I should say, with the New York Metropolitans, you have the richest owner in baseball. Uh, and they almost gave that same exact deal to Correa, a little more money to Machado at 11,350. I think Correa was uh, 12 for 340 or so. Uh, so a little more uh, money on the Machado deal. But I actually think he would have been a better fit for the Mets than Correa. Because what scared me about Correa, give him all that money, all those years. Uh, we already knew before the whole ankle thing came out, too. We always wondered about him with the injuries a little bit. Uh, great player, Correa, but he's not necessarily a slugger by any means. What we uh, were talking about on that December show, me and Joe, was that what we loved about Correa, well, he was a guy with a clutch gene, a guy who's been there before, he's done that, he's won before. Uh, you could put him anywhere in the lineup, two, four, five, wherever you want him, he's going to hit. But I thought Machado would have gave that team one more slugger, uh, which is kind of what they need in addition to Pete Alonso. You don't really have any pure sluggers, per se. Could Alvarez be that guy? Maybe. Uh, I mean, Vogelback's going to hit about 20 home runs, but he's also only going to play maybe 100 games at DH. He's not an everyday option. Uh, so I thought Machado would have been a great fit for the Mets. Uh, but long term, think about it. Juan Soto was mentioned before. I don't know if this means they're automatically out on Soto. Maybe they think Soto wants to hit free agency and he wasn't open to re-signing at this point of his career. I wouldn't blame him either. Okay. Uh, but it opens up the door for the Mets too. Listen, next next free agency, Otani coming around, Soto the year after that. So you know the Mets are ready to pounce on one more big ticket guy at least. Uh, and there are going to be some other options out there despite Machado being off the market now. Yeah, I, I actually think that the Mets kind of caught a break here. Um, not that Machado is not a great player and not that he couldn't serve a purpose, but I think he, the Mets kind of have to get saved from this. They're actually at the point where somebody kind of needs to save them from themselves and they need to go out and trust Beatty. This was always the criticism of the Yankees is that after the core started to get older, they wouldn't trust their prospects to come in and fill those gaps. And they would answer that by going into free agency. So for me, I think the Mets have the plan. We, we understand they went after Correa, but now plan B is Brett Beatty's going to be the third baseman of this future. If, if he proves himself, I think they're going to give the option to Beatty. If he wins it in camp, if he proves that he belongs on this team, to be that third baseman of the future. Him and Alvarez have to come, you know, you can't put a $300 million contract at every position. You have to supplement your big contracts with your top high-end prospects and hope that these guys hit. So chances are only one or two of Beatty and Alvarez are going to hit, but you never know. And if you trust these guys and you say, hey, we're going to supplement our spending with a great farm system, which is the Cohen plan. This is part of it. Machado's off the board. Correa is gone. There are no more options left at third base. You're going to have to trust this kid, and I think he's earned that shot. Yes, correct. And, uh, and I think between uh, between Batty and uh, Escobar too, because don't forget, Escobar was the guy who was uh, kind of getting kicked out of his spot there, the incumbent third baseman for the Mets. I actually think that's a very good platoon you have. You have the veteran who's going to start against the lefties. Uh, you tend to see more righties anyway, so Batty's going to get the majority of the playing time at third base. You can play a little left field also. I know they're also going to try Escobar a little bit in left field, more so for W's, uh, BC prep, but uh, I think he has played a little bit of corner outfield in his career too. So uh, I think between the two of those guys, you're set in the short term. You hope Batty takes that next step uh, and becomes a third baseman of the future. We shall see what happens there. You also have Vientos, too, and he's also getting a little look at first base, which I like, uh, give you a little first base step behind Alonso. But that's another guy who's going to come in, and it looks like he he could hit these lefties pretty hard. I mean, he smoked a double in the gap the other day yeah. uh, against a lefty pitcher. So 
Uh, that could be a possible long-term option. Maybe you do a platoon of Batty and Vientos. Uh, Vientos is more of a DH than Batty. Uh, I'm not saying Beatty's the best third baseman anyway. Uh, I know he's got to work on his fielding, but we, we shall see what happens. But in addition to the Manny Machado news, which is more of an impact on one team and outside of maybe the Mets who might have looked to sign him, uh, there is some big news across the game of baseball, and that is the latest rule changes for this year. So let's go through this new rules. We have three big new rules coming to MLB this year. Uh, Rich, bring it. Why don't you bring up that oh, list? Yeah, absolutely. Here. And here they are. These are the uh, the official rule changes for the 2023 season, which I'm sure many of you know uh, by now. A lot of the players don't know. They're they're finding out themselves firsthand during spring training. I thought it was funny that we just mentioned Manny Machado and how <laughs> in his very first at bat he got the uh, the first infraction of the uh, the spring, which is funny. But yes, the pitch timer: 15 seconds, bases are empty; 20 seconds for runners on base. Uh, hitter receiving one timeout per plate appearance. And obviously, the uh, the hope is that there's going to be reduction by uh, almost a half hour of uh, of play here. So starting with that, the the pitch clock, which is I, I believe the most controversial of the three major changes, and we did yeah. do a poll about this uh, earlier on Instagram, and most voted for the pitch clock as the rule that they'd like to see just get lifted automatically. Um, what do you guys think? We'll start with Tom here. Hopefully, Tom is is with us now. I know he's having some issues here in the new studio. <laughs> yeah, but, new uh, we're new new studio. We're we're figuring figuring out some of the connection. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll be honest. I I like the idea of the the pitch clock. Um, I think they might need to tinker with maybe the the timing of it. Maybe it needs to to give the guys a little bit more time, but. There's just some games that come to a screeching hole. I know, uh, you know, a guy with David Price isn't. I don't even know if David Price is pitching anymore. But like, anytime you watch a David Price game, it's like, it's absolutely miserable. He would take like a minute between pitches, and it's. I get it. Baseball's the game with no clock and and, and all of that, but it it drags so much. And uh, I think they had to find a way to to speed it up. Maybe the fifteen. What's fifteen? No one on twenty with guys on base, right? Maybe that yep. needs to be tweaked a little bit. Um, you know, we had a game, what, the first day of spring training where there was a – I mean, granted, spring training games end in ties, but it was like a, a walk-off pitch clock infraction and then the <laughs> game just ended. It was just, you know, it was, it was weird like that. But, um, yeah, I, I like the idea of it, just maybe some tinker. Yeah, it, it's it... – Definitely controversial for sure. Uh, my initial thought with the pitch clock, I did not like it. I, 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 that of the three new rules, this is the only one I was strongly against. But going to the point of time, uh, think about it. game starting at seven ten. You have a little bit of a rain delay. What if you're starting at eight o'clock? A three and a half hour, four hour game. All of a sudden, it's midnight on the East Coast. People got to work the next morning, and you look at the times of these games so far across spring training. And again, it's spring training. We'll see how it plays to the regular season. You're right around two and a half hours, which I think is a sweet spot for what you're trying to target in terms of game time. Spring training last year averaged a little over three minutes. I think it was around 3.05 roughly a game. So that is about 30-minute improvement. Regular season was closer to 3.30. So if you're anywhere between 2.30 and 3 in the regular season, I think that's a, that's a pretty win. Uh, I can remember one game I was at City Field. It was against the Brewers in 2021. It was a 7 o'clock game, and the game went to the 10th inning. It, I didn't leave that stadium until midnight. I'm like, oh, come on. It, it's, it's, it's a, it's, granted, it was a Saturday night, but come on. I want to get out of there already, man. Uh, so I, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, they do have to tinker it a bit. Whether it's time, I don't know. They definitely have to do something about trying to change the ball. Uh, because any time now, if a pitcher's going for a ball change, that's pretty much an automatic ball. Uh, no pun intended. So we'll see. Uh, Except, you know, I mean, those guys are just going to, I don't know. Those guys are just going to take advantage of that, though. They're just, I know Karen yeah. Check got dinged for it, um, who famously takes forever between pitches. And yeah, so like if, if guys are just going to switch the ball out every time to get them an extra 10, 15 seconds, then, uh, you know, and there should be Here's some kind thing. of thing against that. Here, Here's the thing. I, I, I like the pace that the game has with a pitch clock on it. It prevents the egregious pitchers, the Glennon Rushes of the world, the Dice K <laughs> Masuzakas. The Future player to be named later the on the human rain delays. I saw a video. Yeah, not go with anyone on base. 
they uh, I saw a video online today. It took um Pedro Baez in the 2016 World Series like seven inside the park home runs to throw two pitches. Correct. Like, like there, there's clearly a, a, a problem. And the problem that MLB has is every time they try and institute a change that is not rooted with consequence, the players don't play ball. We saw this with the B in the box rule. This was a simple and effective way and a common sense way to speed up the game. And every and what they hired a whole mess of teams to sit there and watch games and hit a button every time a batter didn't get back in the box and fine them a minuscule mm -hmm. amount of dollars, a $500 fine every time they didn't get back into the box. Yeah. But it, they, the players just ignored it until MLB gave up. So MLB turned around and said, okay, now we're going to do something you're not going to like, you're not going to complain about, but because we were clever enough and smarter than Tony Clark and the Players Association, we put a, a, a – bylaw into the cba so commissioner manfrey can institute any rule he wants so now what we've done is we've gone from okay let's let's discuss together meaningful change that can help the game along to a mechanism that has gone zero to 100 and the fundamental thing i have about this pitch clock is you are not necessarily punishing the egregious pitcher by this you are punishing all pitchers by this or all hitters by this. And instead of finding a middle ground, let's say the pitch clock was 25 seconds with nobody on. All right. And on base, you had 30, 35 seconds. The, the idea of physically having it will speed up the game more so than the fact that you're rushing pitchers right now, 15 seconds, the game feels rushed. You don't have time to shake up. You don't have time to do the basic parts of baseball that make baseball what it is which is a thinking man sport and it feels one two three boom next one two three and it's not supposed to feel like that and we could have come to a middle ground where we made baseball still feel like baseball while knowing that these guys have been sped up and okay we shave 15 minutes off this year next year we take two or three seconds off the clock the year after we go and work our way down so we get used to seeing the quicker product without trying to just axe, uh, chop a, somebody's head off with an axe mm -hmm. right away. Yeah. I, you I, know, I, that's the problem that baseball ran into here. They tried too much too quick. And if they added five to 10 seconds on each side, I think you would get the speed up improvement of 15 or 20 minutes while still resembling the game of baseball. You know, there's nothing I hate more than agreeing with Joe and, 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 you know, but one thing I, I also kind of thought about this is, is Joe, and you making the point a lot last season for those who watched a lot of us last year of, of pitchers being too, just, they throw as hard as they possibly can. They lose mm -hmm. control. And part of that is they could take so much time between pitches. You can kind of get yourself ramped up again and, and go. Uh, maybe giving less time in between pitches, pitchers can't just throw as hard as, as humanly possible because they're going to gas out even faster. So I'm hoping maybe this could be an unintended consequence of, of pitchers maybe having to throw with more control because they can't just gas themselves because they're only going to last 12 pitches at that point. I'm my point by saying that I think this is great for the game. Um, I, I'm one of those that I think right now, this is this. I think they should run with what they have we're in spring training. We're two, three days into spring training games. Let's see how these players adjust over these next few weeks. It's going to be a little screwy that now some of these players are going to the world baseball classic, which are, which do not have these timing rules in play. So it's going to be a little weird for them to like start to learn this new rule and then go back to what they were doing last year to just come back to what they were playing. It's, it's very weird how they, they kind of like sketch that up. Um, but I think this is great for the game. I, I always look back at this example that MLB Network put out last year with Blake Parker, who was a veteran reliever in the game, and they showed a comparison to his exact pitching sequence in 2022 when he was pitching in minor league ball when they were testing the pitch clock rule to 2021 when he was pitching with the Indians at the time. And there was a 50, sorry, a 37 second uh, difference between sequences where, of course, it was 37 seconds longer when he was pitching in the majors just a year ago. So, uh, and 37 seconds doesn't sound a lot, but when you add 30 to 35 batters for each team, uh, you're talking about, yeah, just roughly a half hour of baseball uh, being you know, erased from the game. So, 
I'm cool with this rule. I think, uh, as the chat is saying, it's a great foundation to start. Is it going to be something they tinker with? Of course they do, because they always tinker with these rules at the end of the day. Um, now, where fans are getting mad at with uh, within the, the first couple of games of spring training, I guess to play devil's advocate, you think they're mad with the rule, or you think they're mad with, with how many changes there have been in the game over this, the last couple of years? Well, just changes, but also enforcements as well with the um, – with the uh, what do you call it? the the illegal substances last year, um, the the expansion of instant replay, the pace of play rules. Uh, there's been a lot of changes tossed out in the last five or, or six years alone. Uh, are fans just seeing saying, "Hey, enough's enough"? Can we just stick with the, the current game for a little bit and see what happens? I mean, I, baseball fans are just like notoriously curmudgeons and hate. True. Like, I feel like some baseball fans don't change their underwear every day because they hate change and, <laughs> and they refuse to do try anything different. Um, but yeah, I, I do think there has been a lot that has been thrown out, but also baseball has declined in popularity. Like overall, like nationally, I know regionally it's still really popular, but nationally, you know, kids especially don't like it as much. So yeah, you do need to do things to make the game more exciting to, to entice, you know, kids to watch it. And, and, you know, the idea of like, well, they should just learn to love it. Like, sorry, like things move faster now. I, I, everything is the kids get stuff so quick and they're not, they're just like, fine. If, if that's what this is, then I, I won't watch it. I'll just, I'll, I'll watch more NBA. I'll watch more NFL, I'll watch more soccer, hockey, other things. So they had to, you have to adapt. You have to adapt somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I think too, with the, uh, with, with, with the fans there, fans in MLB, Hard to gain viewership right now. Uh, I know trying to expand the the fan base there, but I think the fans are just overall not happy with MLB itself. I mean, you're coming off of a lockout just a season ago. Uh, all of these rule changes, Manfred just keeps saying, oh, this is for what the fans want. This is what the fans want. I don't remember ever getting a poll asking what I want. Uh, so they're just doing this stuff thinking it's helping the game. Maybe some does, maybe it doesn't. Uh, I just think overall... The fans of MLB not really happy with the league itself. Manfred, if you were to do a poll, I'm sure is one of the most unpopular commissioners of all time. Uh, I would love to see that official poll. One last thing, though, too, I want to bring up with the uh, with the pitch clock here is if you guys remember in the postseason last year, this was a big thing. And I remember watching you, Darvish, at City Field, Bassett on the mound as well in, in that playoff series. They couldn't hear with the pitch comm. What's going to happen there if they can't get the pitch comm call in and they have a 15 second no more pitch comm? Yeah, at they're this point, you're gonna, they're, they're not going to do it back. because yep. there's not enough time to punch it. It's back to rudimentary signs. Yep, and and I mean, it's a good I think point though because if that if that if it goes yes. out after like you you know whoever Bassett throws his first pitch strike and then it goes out like to quickly say oh I can't hear. And then for the, the catcher to have to quickly, especially if this guy's on base, go through a sequence, like that, that is a, a legit mm -hmm. issue that I yeah, but the other thing should is have a way of dealing the, with the pitch com was there to eliminate sign stealing, which is which is a joke. Uh with a 14 second clock with nobody on base, there's no time to steal the signs. There's no time enough, to yeah. relay that. You Absolutely. know what I mean? So I don't mm -hmm. think that's a problem in this in this situation. I think what's gonna happen is you're going to be in the dugout. All these at bats are going to be pre planned, basically. It's going to be like an NFL game where you have a certain amount of plays. You're going to plan out your innings and you're going to go by a pitch sequence. I think what we're going to now have is we're going to have a study of patterns that are basically scripted. And when you're past the first five pitches, then everybody's got to go off script. You're going to see who adapts quickest. So, um, but again, like I said, it, it, I, I think overall with these rule changes, I think there's a lot of them really quick. I think it's a fundam fundamental misunderstanding of what gets attention in baseball. Um, and I think a lot of these rule changes are making baseball look less and less like baseball. And I think that's the big problem. Now, there's also the other side of it where, you know, the shift was obviously terrible for the sport. I know it, it was part of the game. I welcome the shift change because it genuinely took away thousands of hits in an MLB season. It was and, and nobody was adapted. The analytics said the best way is to swing for the fence, and if you strike out, it doesn't matter. But in 
that particular case, I think that's an actual positive change. I think the ghost runner on second base, that's a it's men's league softball garbage. That's what that is. And we now have a commissioner who wants it to be men's league softball. Honestly, instead of making the bases bigger, why didn't you just add a runner's base if you want to reduce injuries and collisions? Just yeah. add a runner's base. That that would have made a ton of sense. I mean, that, that's what all these men's leagues do. I mean, we all play softball here, and they, they all do the same thing with the runner's base. The, the base change rule, though, I know that's our second official rule Who cares? Uh, that we're discussing next. tonight. Exactly. I'm indifferent about it. The two things I want to see, one, does it truly help base stealing? We shall see. Two, I am curious to see how many injuries are saved. If it's one guy on my team that's not rolling an ankle, I'll be happy. Uh, but again, remains to be seen. But I'm, the, I'm thing the, the thing with the base rule is – you can't visualize it, right? When you're in the stands or when you're on TV, the you're not you can't tell a three inch difference in the bases from watching. And that's the thing. That's a change that baseball implemented that makes sense because it's basically non-visual. You can't tell that they've been changed. There's no you you wouldn't know if that was the only change implemented. The pitch clock is an obtrusive change it feels like you've put the game on fast forward and i gotta I put joe on a rant clock for empire state of baseball this year because <laughs> this is getting ridiculous go over the two minutes to get muted on the show all right last rule real quick just want to run through it uh the the ban on shifts uh i this one is <laughs> this one's debatable too i this is one of those where i actually don't think they should have banned the shift and i know it means more offense but you're taking a little bit more strategy out of the game. Uh, I I didn't understand why we're punishing ma good, like good management of, of defense. You guys are professional baseball hitters. Learn how to hit the other way. I, I it's I mean that's easier said than done though. Again, we're we're dealing with it. it's not, not a, a your game. Job. No, These but we're dealing. It's, it's, it's a different it's a different game though. I mean, if you're talking about like you know in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you have starting pitchers who would go seven, eight innings. You would see that guy over and over again. And then they're, you know, a lot of times bullpens were were pretty trash. Now it's you get these guys from out of the bullpen, they throw over a hundred. The stuff is nastier than it's ever been. It's a lot harder to just oh, just hit it the other way. I I, I fundamentally do believe that. I I know the shift chain, the, the the banning of the shift was. I don't I don't know if they should have done both. I know it's it's the two on either side and then gotten and, and feet on the dirt. I think the feet on the dirt thing is maybe what bothered i like the most about it because i i hated seeing guys hitting line drives to right field that were outs just line drives these are singles they, you see off the bat that's a single and it's it's an out um but i, I think it's going to bring a lot more not just of offense but defense to the game too you know we we uh, part of like all of our childhoods were we're watching you know espn top 10 baseball tonight web gems and those plays of like athletic middle infielders have just died with the shift because it's just like, oh, I'm just going to hit it. And there's going to be a guy in short right field and he throws out the, the runner. So we're going to get that back in baseball. Um, so, again, I feel like the idea of what they tried to do here, maybe a little tinkering could have been done to it. Maybe tinkering still will be done to it. But I like what it can do for the game. Yeah, yeah. This the shift, I just want to talk real quick on the shift here. If you would have asked me this about five years ago, I would have been dead set against it. I'm like, listen, it's strategy. I'm all for it. Let the managers manage. But uh, in reality, the hitters should have went the opposite way. And guess what they didn't do? They didn't go the opposite way. Instead, the analytics folks came in and said, oh, launch angle, crush the baseball. What does that lead to? More pulling the baseball, uh, making the shift even that more effective. I can't seem to pull up the tweet right now, but you look at the numbers of batting averages, and this is going back to when the shift really oh, became mm -hmm. popular uh, in like maybe 2013, 14, 15. Uh, and you look at the team averages below two, uh, 240. And prior to, I think it was like 2013, it was zero. Zero teams were averaging an average less than 240. And then slowly, one, two, five. Now it's like 20 it's teams like 20 in baseball. Yeah. yeah, it's absurdly crazy. Uh, and I can't tell you how many times last year I was watching the game, someone absolutely hits a missile, smokes one up the middle. I'm like, all right, there we go, clean base hit right to a field. I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. Really? The second baseman's <laughs> playing right there? Uh, I could tell you one thing that this is going to do. More balls in play that are going to get through, which is great for the game. Again, pitch clock, I didn't like it at first, but I'll tell you what, that's helping to reduce the time of the game. 
the big bases, maybe a little more steals, you're getting back potentially, potentially to more of an old school baseball, more live action. That's what's going to excite me because watching baseball in 2006 versus baseball the last several years, night and day difference. I'd much rather watch an 06 game than a 2022 game any day of the week. Uh, so I'm curious to see how it plays out for sure. Uh, we'll see how it happens. Yeah. So two two things with the band and the shift. One, you could not institute a pitch clock if you had shifts because we would have gotten into this weird mode where analytics would have said it's worth giving up a ball for a pitch clock violation if you're messing with your infield. That's one. Two, the thing is baseball has become – such a lack of movement game that they had no choice. No sports league in history has ever made it easier on the defense to prevent runs. There has never been a rule change instituted. Doesn't matter what league you look in NBA ban and hand checking NFL, basically Banning you from mugging the line of scrimmage, <laughs> NHL instituting the trapezoid and preventing uh, uh, the the neutral zone trap. All that stuff has been instituted in every league, and there's thousands more. Baseball is pretty much the only one that has made it almost non different from 1900 to play defense. This is one of the first times baseball has actually made it harder to play defense, and that's just because the defensive defenses have gotten so good it put baseball in a no-win scenario you could not let this continue for another five years yeah you get the 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 mcneils of the world the uh arias is that that defy the shift but there there are so few and far between and other than occasional bunts down the line nobody and, and nobody really wants to watch that so baseball made a move here they did what every league in the history of professional sports did was make it harder to play defense, and it's gonna it's gonna work. It's gonna work like a charm. You're gonna see a lot more offense in the league, um, and and that's gonna be a well. In my mind, at this point, it's welcome. You have a gold glove right. shortstop. So, You're in good we, shape. We will see if uh, old school Damn, baseball and core remembers it in 2006 returns. Uh, we still have a whole half a show left. So if you if you push the over on us going over time, you know, you're winning money tonight. Uh, so let's get into uh, the MLB All Season Report cards. But before we get there, Tom, best way to follow us on our socials. As long as I don't get uh, booted here. So yeah, um, <laughs> follow, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at ESB Podcast. Uh, you can follow Corey at G Gory, Joe at Junior Pubs, Rich at Rich J Rivera, and me at T Wasp. We also can follow us on Instagram at Empire State of Baseball. There you go. Give us a follow. Give us some love. We're going to have some good stuff being posted on both Twitter and social and, and uh, Instagram over the last month. So stay tuned and follow and share. And we'll be all season report cards. This is the big crux of tonight's show. Uh, early on in our all season episodes, we did an agenda for both the Mets and Yankees. And uh, we were hopeful uh, that we were going to get some big signings and certainly both teams uh, did did so. They, I think the, the Yankees and Mets definitely didn't disappoint when it came to the back of the newspaper uh, headlines with their teams. But uh, we're going to get into the specific grading. We'll look at some key focus areas, uh, starting with offense, and then we're going to head over to starting pitching, relief pitching, uh, non-player personnel, so executives and coaches, and financial management. And just like old high school, you're going to see a little report card uh, graphic flip on the screen. So Starting with the Yanks here, and we'll go back and forth here. So uh, on offense, uh, Tom and I came together here, and uh, we were in the Bs with, with our grade. Uh, I gave him a B uh, plus. Uh, Mr. Waspel went with uh, an old B here on offense. Tom, why the, uh, the B for, for the Yanks here? Well, they didn't really do a lot of addressing of the offense. They, they, they brought Judge back, which was – which was good. Um, you know, they they didn't address left field like we really, really wanted them to. Um, their offenses still could be very good. They still have a lot of very good um, you know, hitters on the team, but I just don't I don't think if you if you watch that Astro series, they just got absolutely dominated by their pitching, and you would think you'd want to 
improve the offense significantly. Like they, you know, improved the pitching um, and they just didn't. Uh, now where this could get better and then maybe we kind of talk about this, but some of the decisions they make is, you know, do you start is Peraza the starting shortstop is Volpe. Does he come up at some point of the season to kind of give the, the offense a, a shot in the arm? Um, Cause if not, it's, they, they didn't, they didn't really do anything. I didn't miss anything. Right. I know I've been changing diapers and, and, and all of that, but I, there was, there was no, right. There was, there was no signing that I missed there. So, no, the only thing it, you missed was a good Wi-Fi router. But outside of no, that, uh, right. no, you didn't miss much. I mean, that's pretty much been the crux of their of of their of their off season when it came to when it came to offense. Yeah, um, offense is a cool kid in high school, but you know he's got to he's got to improve here. That's why I gave him a B plus. Uh, Joe said it on this show many times. You don't get extra credit for signing your own guys, and Joe's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. Listen, you still re-signed the MVP, so you get a little credit for that. But outside of that, you're still entering the season with the with the castaways at Hicks and Donaldson. You have to have a lot of faith in some of the prospects coming through the system. Uh, but this is not that much of a different team. And I'll even they lost a couple of batters in there too. Joe, I know you're going to say something here. What do but, you got? But a B plus is a good grade. So how are, how are you guys giving them a B plus when they listen? The the Mets are almost in the same boat. The, the, the only thing they did was bring back Nimmo and they're relying on a prospect to come up. But I, not to spoil that, but we, we gave lower grades. You don't get – I understand judge is judge. But at the end of the day, it's actually a worse offense because you lost Ben Benintendi. Ben Benintendi didn't play. I mean, he he played yeah, like but, a handful of games. I, I think I – think, But the yeah. offense is worse than it was at the end of last year. I mean, I mean, yes and no. Hey, you listen, if you give me Praza at shortstop, that's – I mean, Praza is an upgrade. He's, he's a left fielder. No, Cabrera. Yeah. You got the wrong – you got the wrong oh, odds. No, no but, you know Hicks is starting in left well, field. Listen, I, B plus, they get the plus. It was going to be a B. You get the plus. You, you did re-sign the reigning American League MVP. So it's not like – Yeah, it would be a C plus. Blow my nose to that. So, all because right. Because the B offense plus, isn't B, better. You can't rely on the – the thing is – the relying on the prospects to be big offensive explosive guys. First of all, I th- I don't think Volpe is going to be up until late in the year if he's up at all this year. Second of all, I I don't know. I mean, is Oswaldo going to be the guy? I I I don't think anybody. I don't, knows I don't know. They still don't know which Oswald or Oswaldo you're talking about because I think you're confused as well. A Peraza, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's Oswald. Uh, listen, he's, <laughs> yeah. what, he he was good when he played last year. Um, he is an upgrade over IKF if he's going to be the starting shortstop. Uh, I, I do firmly believe that. Hicks in left field, yeah, that's not great. Um, but listen, it's they, they, they have – It's not yeah, great. It's, it's, it's bad. <laughs> all right, well, listen, the New York – I like Bader. I, I got to say, I, I like Bader. I like the dimension. He gives the Yankees exactly mm-hmm. what you need. Love you Bader. hope he can be a, around a 260, 270 hitter. But they they need more. I mean that that's just the reality. Corey, what do you got uh, on the report card on, on on your kid over there, the New York Mets? Yeah, so for the New York Metropolitans, I mean, listen, I, I looked at it in two ways: how I look at the offense going into next season, and how I thought they improved the offense coming off of last season. I'm going to start first with the latter, uh, and I did not think they had the best of off seasons when it came to the offensive side of the ball. I mean, Correa would have completely changed the conversation, but Uh, You look at the offense, uh, one of the big criticisms of this Mets team from last year uh, was their lack of hitting down the stretch, Uh, especially in the playoffs. They did not hit at all. It seemed like that whole month of September, they were just off their game a little bit on the offensive side. Uh, And how did they do in terms of bringing guys in? Well, you brought in Tommy Pham. Uh, I did not like that move. He didn't have the best reputation coming into the uh, you know, into the off season. Uh, and then you look at the interview we had just the other day, not exactly the type of interview you'd want to have if you're a new guy on a, a team trying to win now. So uh, overall, I'm not happy at all with the fan pickup. I hope he uh, makes me eat my words. Uh, and Omar Navarez, again, listen, it's not often you bring in a catcher who hits 304 and it's an improvement at catching. That's just goes to show you how bad James McCann was last year at 195. Uh, I mean, 204, excuse me. Yeah. But uh, Omar Navarro's, though, will be an offensive improvement over McCann. Uh, Take away last year aside. I mean, he was an all-star in 2021, did hit 22 home runs in 2019. Again, 
He's a stopgap option. You hope Alvarez comes up at some point. Again, most of it will be probably a DH. But uh, Navarez should be a little bit of an improvement over McCann. Uh, so the offseason overall was probably more of a D, to be honest. I mean, maybe even an F when it comes to offense. Oh. Offense. But the Mets team still have a good offense. Don't forget, they have last year's batting champ in Jeff McNeil. They have a guy in Pete Alonso who can win a home run title. You have an all-star in Lindor. You have a great solid piece in Marte if he's healthy. Nimmo, very underrated and underappreciated, high on base percentage guy to lead off that team. They have a lot of good offensive players. So if I look at the overall outlook going into next season uh, in combination with the off season and not really improving what you were trying to improve, I balanced it out right in the middle C+. Yeah, so I, I mean, I wouldn't even if they didn't sign Tommy Pham, I would, I would have gave him the same grade because uh, Tommy Pham is not really anything. But the Mets, the thing with the Mets is they have a good offense. They try, we did try to improve it. This grade could have been an A with Carlos Correa, uh, as Tom continues to have studio connectivity issues. Um, it could have been an A if they had locked up Car- Carlos Correa. We know that at the end of the day. Beatty is one of the top position prospects in Major League Baseball. He's got a ton of power. He's going to play in some capacity. I'm not so much worried about this Mets team long-term ability to add to the offense if they need. And B, their offense was good up until the end of last year. And last year they went cold, partially due to the fact that Marte got hurt. That didn't help. Ruff was a waste of life. Um, and, and so was James McCann. So I think you've kind of corrected that in, in getting rid of McCann. Um, at the end of the day, it's a C. You don't really move up or down uh, from where you were last year. I expect this team to score. There's going to be dry spells. We know that. But at the end of the day, they are a good offensive team. Um, I think unlike the Yankees grade where the Yankees had very specific needs they need to fill, and didn't the Mets didn't have any glaring needs. They need another home run hitter behind Alonzo. But other than that, they don't have any massive holes in the offense where you're like that. That's just a complete dead zone, except for catcher. But everybody has that nowadays. Oh, Joe, I really wish we had a rant clock here. The amount of fractions you would commit would just be ungodly. All right, we're going to stick with the Mets. Here. You can just, we'll you probably can mute him if you wanted to. Oh, I does too. Uh, I, I do have that that power. Uh, we're we're going to move on to the next focus area. Stick with the Keep Mets moving. here. Uh, with the starting pitching, obviously it's been a it was a, a thrill ride when it when it comes to starting pitching. Uh, but Corey and uh, Joe gave him some uh, some pretty good grades here. Yeah, uh, we both we yeah. both gave the Mets A's. Um, I think the only thing in the Mets case, uh, the Mets had basically three rotation spots to fill. Uh, they filled them with uh, Verlander, Senga, and uh, Quintana. So they've really, you know, did a good job being on the free agent market, being active. Uh, Senga basically replaces Chris Bassett. Quintana basically replaces Taiwan Walker. Walker went to the Phillies. Uh, Bassett, as we know, went to Toronto. Um, I think the Mets were scared off of Bassett uh, due to the pitch clock and the fact that he's one of the slowest pitchers in baseball if if i was being honest um i think the only thing that prevents this from being an a plus is the fact that degrom isn't back um and listen we know what degrom is verlander may be better than him uh simply because verlander pitches and degrom doesn't um or is less reliable but we know that when you lose the biggest pitcher the best pitcher on the planet um when he's healthy that no matter who you replace him with you always have that slight risk that you've lost something in that rotation. Yeah, I thought I thought this Mets team did a phenomenal job this offseason when it came to the starting pitching, and that was the Mets' biggest strength last season, and I think it will still be the same this coming season. Uh, I mean, you lost a, a, what 
should be a Hall of Famer in DeGrom. I mean, we'll see how uh, how many starts mm. he gets the rest of his career. But I do think he should be a Hall of Famer. Uh, you lost a Cy Young winner in DeGrom. You replaced him with last year's Cy Young Award winner in Justin Verlander, who had even a better year last year than Jacob DeGrom. Uh, a little concerned with the age, you know, but I do think Verlander pitches more innings this year than DeGrom will for the Rangers, so that's a plus. You lost Bassett. Bassett was a high-end number three pitcher. Uh, he actually pitched the most games for the Mets last year. He was a workhorse. F- fell apart a little bit down the stretch when it mattered most. I know he had a bad Braves game. Uh, fell apart in the wild card a little bit there. Uh, but you replace him with Kodai Senga, uh, essentially swapping out more of the safer play with Bassett for the high risk, high reward in Sanga. Are you going to get a guy like a Tanaka who comes in and pitches well right off the rip? Or are you going to get a Keigawa? You never know. I hope it's uh, the no. former in Tanaka. Uh, but we'll, we'll see how Sanga plays out. And Quintana, you could do a lot worse than Quintana as your fifth starter. And the other thing I like about this Mets rotation right now is the depth. Peterson right now would slot as your number six. McGill is your number seven. I mean, you have quality MLB pitching depth, which is an absolute importance, especially when your two best players uh, are on the wrong side of 30. I mean, Verlander, I think, just turned 40, uh, and Scherzer is right up there as well. So uh, I'm very happy with the depth. I'm not going to give them a perfect grade because you know there's always some risk there with the older guys, but a uh, great offseason for pitching. Um, you like that Keigawa name drop there from Corey? No, I put that out there. <laughs> All right, starting pitching for the Yanks. Um, yeah, we're feeling pretty positive too here, Tom. Uh, a couple A minuses for uh for this student. Yeah, the the Yankees went out and signed the best, definitely the best, you know, starting pitcher if you're if you're talking about into the future as well. I mean, the Verlander won the Cy Young last year, but he's not a, a long term solution. Where Carlos Rodon is definitely a guy who you expect to to be a big pitcher for. You know, the sign up for a six year deal, right? Six year, six year deal, whatever. Yeah, six year um, deal. Yeah. So that's, that's going to, it's a longer term like investment. Um, so that, that's, that's great. The Yankees starting pitching was, was really good last year. They did lose Tyone, but, you know, essentially replacing him with a better pitcher and Rodon is, is, is pretty nice. Nestor's back. Cole's still there, though people hate him for seemingly no reason. Um, you know, Severino, and then it looked really nice when you had Frankie Montas as your as your five. Now he just decided he doesn't want to play baseball because he's been hurt and just decided like, hey, now I want to get surgery and, and not get surgery four months ago. We're in, I think whatever. that's where it doesn't – it's not an A or an A-plus for me because you still yeah. didn't replace Montas. I wasn't expecting them to at the I end of the day. They, it it still, really was because you have done at that options, point. But it's not, it's not like they went out and, and tried to replace him uh, with oh. somebody who's you know really available in free agency or on, a, on another team. Um, yeah, but well, I mean, yeah. we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll see about that. Yeah, Mark right. Uh, no, uh, he Mark is a Mark. St. Louis Cardinal. Yeah, it's probably Herman oh. or or Clark Schmidt. Um, Herman, you know, I think everyone's <laughs> hoping for Clark Schmidt. Yeah. Can't hear Love me that. yet. No. Yeah, no, we got you. We got you. Tom. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of Yankee fans would rather Clark Schmidt over Domingo Herman and the, you know all the baggage that comes with Domingo Herman. Um, it'd be great if they would go out and acquire a, a pitcher at this point, but it, it'd have to be through a trade. Um, you'll know, we'll see if there's anyone, you know, pitching is always so hard to get. So who just wants to shed a, a quality four or five starter is you, you, know, can, you're, you're you can pay easily, for it. You can absolutely easily get to the trade deadline with what you have in this rotation, even you without know, Montas, who was uh, an albatross for this team. Uh, for that half season, the Bronx, uh, the Yankees do have a very respectable. Uh, respectable is actually probably uh, I'm probably underestimating them. They have a star-studded rotation. So yeah, I, I mean, really- like a guy like a Quintana would have been like if you knew Monta- Montas wasn't going to pitch, like that would have been mm-hmm. hey, that that been a great move for the Yankees yeah. to make, you know. But he was already gone. Like they, they, no, there's nothing left at that point. So it's kind of hard to ding them for that for something that's really out of their control. Just keeping it moving here. I'm going to go right to relief pitching. And uh, Tom and I also on the same page here, B plus in relief pitching, Uh, you know, for a team that doesn't have a lockdown closer, you can say the Yankees had five legitimate back end options in Holmes, Eliza, Peralta, Marinaccio and, and uh, Michael King uh, that people are forgetting is come is back from injury. He's uh, he avoided the Tommy John. Thank God. 
Uh, but now they added Tommy Kane, lead the veteran presence back to that bullpen, who was a good part Tommy of that. Next is your leaf staff for a couple seasons. So it was a nice ad for them. So it, it's a B plus. Um, they didn't drastically improve it. It's still a fine bullpen. It's it's a top bullpen. They just don't have that lockdown closer. And it's just going to have to be one of those jobs that's one in spring training most likely. Um, and you'll see if they, they address this thing in time. Yeah, it's like if you think of it like, you know, like MLB the show, they do the Yankees have a, a guy in the bullpen who's like a 95 or 96 overall? No, but do they have no. like six guys who are 88 and above? Yeah, they have. I mean, Clay Holmes, although uh, very up and down, but Lawise is good. Marinaccio, Lutrevino was good last year. Yes, um, um, Michael King back. Uh, they, they have a Canely, they have a lot of quality arms there. Um, relief pitching is, is the most volatile position in all of sports. So listen, you, you hope that three of those guys have it this year. A couple of them probably won't, um, just look at Clay Holmes two years ago and Clay Holmes last year. Um, so I think a B plus is, is fair. It's just going to figure out who, who is going to be in these roles and maybe they don't do roles. Maybe they do kind of move past that. Like, Hey, here's our closer. It's just who's hot at the time where the matchups dictate and, uh, you know, roll with the, roll with that guy. A lot of positive transactions for the Mets side in relief pitching. What grade did you give them? Yeah, I, I gave the Mets an A minus when it came to the relief pitching, and they were one move away from going to an A plus in my book in the off season prediction Skipping show. Yeah. Yep, I, I they were. I had four predictions, big predictions for the Mets pen, and the Mets did three of the four. The biggest one being Diaz. You had to bring Diaz back. It would have been a complete travesty if they let diaz walk so you, you don't get him points back. for resigning your guys though which, joe which made the true. rules so and, well <laughs> that's that's true and that's probably why joe gave the b plus but out also big guy to bring back he was such a credit. critical part of that bullpen uh last year out really stepped up in big spots in the second half of the season i mean he was almost as reliable as diaz and he actually had a lot of closing opportunities last year because diaz had a lot of eighth inning appearances buck going with the uh, the non-traditional closer role there to go in the best biggest spot not necessarily the ninth inning so out would bring a big get david robertson i really like this pickup that's a guy who's going to go out there again late in the game gives you a veteran option there had a solid year last year i really want him at the deadline uh so at least they found a way to get robertson anyway uh, the one move that was missing, I would have loved the second lefty. Uh, I know they did go ahead. They made the trade with the uh, with the Rays, uh, bringing in uh, Raleigh, Brooks right. Raleigh. Yeah, Brooks Raleigh. So uh, I, if they got Andrew Chafin, that would have been an A plus offseason. I would have loved that second lefty to get two reliable lefty options. But we'll see what happens. And then the back end of the bullpen. We know Peterson and McGill are going to be in conversation for long relief. And then you're going to have a lot of these guys, like five or six decent options, battling for that last spot or two in the pen. So overall, I'm very happy with this pen going into this coming season. Yeah, I, I gave it a B plus. And uh, again, it's wild that I gave it a B plus and, and the Yankees did nothing. And both of these guys gave them higher grades. Oh, um, but, you know, what, what, what are you going to do there? Listen, the Mets Better have... Bullpen. The Mets probably have the best bullpen in baseball at the end of the day at the moment. They re-signed the best relief pitcher in baseball in Edwin Diaz. They had to get that done. They brought back Adovino. Listen, they brought in David Robertson, who has experience late in games. That is a huge part of this uh, bullpen now. Uh, they got Brooks Raley, who's got a high upside. Drew Smith came into his own and proved himself last year. If he could avoid injury, he's going to be a key late in and reliever for them. Moving forward, um, so I David think big... Robertson and Brooks Raley are enough to give you the B plus. What are you talking? They they re-signed Diaz. You don't get credit for re-signing your guys, Joe. It's your own rule. But you they had the credit. Be, for that. But it's the best pitcher in baseball. It's a B plus because it's a it's the best bullpen in baseball. Despite the fact that they're still missing a lefty, you guys gave the Yankees an A minus for bringing in Tommy Canley off of Tommy John and acting like you signed Mariano Rivera. Oh, they you also guys have cut no loose the dead weight. They also cut loose the dead weight, and in that, it was you almost know, an addition Chapman? losing a Raul this year. Last year, it's not an offseason move. It was an offseason move. What are you talking about? I thought they cut him last they year. He cut himself. No. Heading um, into the postseason, yeah, he didn't show up to work. Like, you guys are over. I'm not going to show up. I'm not going to be on the postseason. You don't have it. They cut him in the offseason. 
you don't have a late in an experienced reliever in that bullpen. If you unless you count to Tommy Canley. I mean, you, Clay you're Holmes expecting been too much. Clay Holmes has Clay been the closer. Lewisaga has Lewisaga has, has been a phenomenal reliever for three years. Uh, they never closed a big game in their life. All right, listen. Edwin Diaz, Diaz is our student. Let's put it this we'll way: Edwin Diaz, Diaz our student. Is, and speaking Edwin, of, the Mets have three guys who closed big games before. Edwin Diaz is the best relief pitcher in New York. The next three or four are Yankees. I don't know about that. I I am I could not be more confident. In that. I don't think Edwin so. Diaz is definitely the best. And not, I agree. Know, but I'm not if you them. go those next three, I'm four, with possibly five guys, I will take mm-hmm. Yankees. I will out, take of Dino. out of Dino's up Holmes, there. Loisica King, better than out of Dino and Robertson. Well, out of Dino had a better year than all of them last year. One game to save your life, you're not picking any of the Yankees players. That's the bottom line. I'll, I'll say, I'm you have the, no one to trust in the ninth inning. You're going to take a shot with King or Holmes or whoever you're going to take a shot with. Loisica. And if they stink up the place – your backup is another guy who's never closed in a big spot before. That's the problem with the Yankee bullpen right now is when you're at, when you're you know what is on the line, there is nobody else to turn to that has experience at getting out of it. Two runners on in Houston in the bottom of the ninth. Who are you bringing in to get in that house that, that out that you trust for your life when Altuve is at the plate? The answer is nobody. And, and actually, I'll tell you what, Adovino and Robertson, you technically have three closers because all three of them have legitimate closing You think David Robertson is level. I, and Listen, you're not going to find bigger fans of David Robertson than Yankee fans. David Robertson is not a closer in Major League Baseball. No, he, he closed no, games it. last year. He did. Fine. I mean, you he has that experience, though. There's nobody in the Yankee bullpen that has that experience. That's my point. Now, who's making the decisions on uh, bringing in these guys from the bullpen? Of course, we go to the non player personnel, the manager, the coaches. Hell, even the executive from the from the front office might uh, have an opinion on it. Joe, Corey, uh, what are you grading the Mets on their non player personnel focus this year, this offseason? Yeah, I'll tell you what, for the non-player personnel, I'm going with an A- minus here as well. And uh, I, there, there's a lot of things that go into building a franchise. Obviously, you have the scouting department uh, all the way down to the guys who are serving food at the stadium with the vendors. But uh, I'm going to focus it on two uh, gentlemen in particular, uh, Mr. Buck Showalter. And Buck Showalter, for me, is an A-plus manager. Nobody I like more up there than Buck, at least in my short lifetime, uh, Buck Showalter is right up there uh, with Bobby Valentine, probably of my favorite managers in my lifetime. Uh, I might even like Buck a little more just because I'm older and I could appreciate the game a little more than when I was younger with Bobby Valentine. So I love Buck Showalter, A+. Plus. Billy Epler for right now, I'm going to say a B. And I know we got a little bit of heat last year. Deadline, didn't make the big move, couple of transactions, and eh, it didn't necessarily work out. But uh, honestly, with Epler... You give you give him this Cohen money. I trust him to go out there and make some of these calls. And he didn't even have to make some of these calls because the whole Correa thing was uh, Cohen taking the call from Scott Boris. But uh, I gave Epler a B until he does a move that really, wow, blows me away. Remember, he didn't even get Lindor. That was the last regime. Uh, so I'm going to give Epler a B, Buck Showalter an A+, plus, average out A-. minus. Yeah, I, I think in the Mets case, um, this is one of the first times where – I don't hear anybody on the radio calling up complaining about the Mets staff. And regardless of what moves you make, the fact of the matter is you kept the coaching staff basically intact. I think you get an A for that. Uh, This is a fantastic staff that they have right now. The front office is great. It would have been an A plus if they found a president of baseball ops like David Stearns or something. But uh, for now, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the Mets. I don't, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, and for the Mets, it's this is the perfect staff to guide this team. And Buck Showalter is the perfect manager to manage in these rule changes. 100% he, because agree. nothing gets past him. He will have his team prepared. Uh, what do you got on the non-players for the Yanks? Uh, I think give him a C. What did I do? B minus. And uh, yeah, I only give him a B minus because Matt Blake is there. And Matt Blake is a, is a pitching guru. And what he's done with the, the starting and relief pitching for the team is is incredible um you know we've we've been beaten a dead horse with the yankees front office or the analytics department and, and the annoyance annoyances of that and then basically that running the team and boo not having any making any decisions so that's 
that is what it is. Um, but yeah, Matt Blake's great. And I just, that he's the one carry, he's like the one person in the group project giving his all. And he's going to carry these losers to the B minus. And I'm a Matt Blake guy, but it does, it doesn't do enough for me. It's a C minus. Uh, the start of this Yankee off season uh, saw the extensions of Aaron Boone and Brian Cashman from the jump. And automatically I'm thinking to myself, as many Yankee fans were, well, I guess there's not going to be that much change in the organization. It's going to be same all, same all. And, and pretty much this is the team they got assembled. And uh, I'm not going to castrate Boone, surprisingly, on this one. I'm really going to go hard on Cashman here. He has made a bunch of mistakes, key mistakes in, in trades and free agent signing opportunities uh, that's costed this team big time over these last couple of years. I don't think this man deserved the four-year extension, and I understand his legacy and what he means to the team. I think it was time to just let bygones be bygones and move on. Um, and I don't, and you know, listen, it would have been a completely different off season. Um, if they brought somebody else in there, it might, might be for the better or worse. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know what else, it. what else, to, listen, and I'm not going to, I'm not here to defend Cashman, but what else was he going to do this off season? He, re, he resigned judge. He got Rodon. Yes. He didn't he get did a left exactly fielder. What- he did but exactly what wasn't... he was going to do, it, and there was nothing. It, you you didn't change the folk. You didn't change the the core of this team. This is the same team essentially that lost to the Astros with Carlos Rodon. That's the. But that's Rich, the you were you were waxing poetic in the off season about the hire of Brian Sabian. From the San Francisco Giants, oh, like you're giving him a C minus. Oh, I'm going to add in a, a, a world, a three-time <laughs> World Series GM, and you're what you me. wax I and me. I love me. I love me. I love me. I love me. I think. I think it. I think it's great, but at the end of the day, they're not the one penning these contracts. So, as much as it's nice to have them, you can have a bunch of these former front office execs uh, chime it in. At the end of the day, it's Cashman that's going to put the pen to paper. So, uh, it's a C. It's a C plus for me uh, for the fu- for the uh, for the off uh, for the non-player personnel. All right, we're going to wrap it up here. Yank side. Oh, we are so over time, but let's let's get through this quickly if we can. Uh, Mr. Rivera, Mr. Waspel on financial management, uh, kind of in the same ballpark here, B and an A minus here. Tom, why an A minus? You're a little higher than me on the finances. Yeah, I, I'll be honest. I don't know how the hell we were supposed to grade this. <laughs> okay. Um, it just kind of seemed like, what, what are we doing here? What, are we talking about like the luxury tax? Well, yeah. Uh, I think yeah, you yeah listen, the Yankees. All right. So I, I talked I'll about clarify. it in the beginning. Go on. I'll clarify. I'm sorry, Thomas. I'll clarify a little bit. So, yeah. I, in financial management, I mean, yes, the focus with the luxury tax, managing your resources properly. Did they overspend? Did they overpay for too many players? Uh, did, did they do a good job uh, cutting um, some cost out? I mean, that that's, that's the overall outlook of financial management with uh, with the Yanks and the Mets, which is is a fun topic to consider because they're the two high, highest Yeah, it's like, I don't know. Like uh, we talked about in the, in, in the opening with the Padres giving $350 million for – Man of Machado. The Yankees have as much money as they need to be the best team in baseball if if, if they want to be. How much do they want to spend to that? Like that that's what it comes down to, is what it comes down to with any of these teams. Um, I think that they invested in Judge and again, they went out and got Rodon. Uh, they got they, some bad contracts came off the books with mm-hmm. Britain and with Chapman. Uh, mm-hmm. so they they got money back there. So yeah, I don't know. Like, listen, like, how much are they making on the Yes app? I don't know if that like factors in here. I don't know if we have any new advertisers in the outfield. Like, maybe that could bring in a little bit more money. Um, so I was going with A minus because I feel like just being an idiot. But well, yeah, I mean, all right. You know, well, I don't know. It I mean, just, it, it the Yankees could open their books, and we can go through like, oh, how much is the chicken bucket this year? Like, is that going to go up in price? Because that could really hurt oh, my score. I, 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 with with you listen, they put eighty seven million dollars in AAV between their their key signings of Judge Rodon and uh, Rizzo. So yeah, that, that chicken bucket is definitely going to be a little bit more expensive this year. Uh, Yankees are still going to be the Yankees at the end of the day. That's why I, I'm I'm crediting them with the uh, with an old B here. Uh, yep, they didn't want to go over the threshold um, or the, the the top threshold with the luxury tax. They certainly achieved that unless they decide to get a little funny over the next uh, couple of weeks, but. Uh, they're, they're still the Yanks. They still have a lot of money and, uh, not a lot of ball players. That's the way they are. So they are a B they're right there. All right. So on the Mets end, uh, Joe, Corey, what do you guys got? 
Yeah, so uh, the Mets, as we uh, know, have the biggest financial capability of any team in baseball. I'm giving them an A+. Plus. I know that's ridiculous for saying Only you have the highest plus. payroll in baseball. But the fact of the matter is the Mets have done a very – have had a very unique approach. First of all, they – Doing exactly what Steve Cohen said. So you get extra credit for doing for your owner sticking to his guns. And two, they really actually maintain cap flexibility over the next decade because at least a hundred million dollars is off the books in the next year and a half. So as Scherzer is, is a year with is another like year option. and a half contracts that they signed that I'm unaware of. Verlander is only a two-year deal. Canna has a, uh, you said a year and a half. And I didn't Escobar know Verlander's only signed through option. July or something. Huh? You said a year and a half, so I, uh, I don't I know if years. like Verlander was, two you years. know, like, hey, so, All-Star break, I'm I'm done next year. So I, I the Mets break. have the flexibility going forward that after these older guys go, they will have an opportunity to spend on an Otani or on a Soto because that payroll will not stay at this large level. They're going to maintain that flexibility. They're going to add as needed, and I can, can see them continuing this approach with either pitchers or position players where they give them a high AAV value for a very short uh, year span so it maintains flexibility. Yeah, I, I really love the point you brought up too with the flexibility coming up soon with a lot of this money coming off the books. And I gave the Mets a B here. I know obviously as a Mets fan, I could not be more thrilled. And I mean, imagine you're a Pirates fan. Uh, if you're a, an Athletics fan, a Reds fan, these teams just no money at all. As a Mets no, fan going no, through no, the No, no, no. They have the money. They're just choosing not to spend it. Correct. That it, That's a great point. They don't well. have Steve Cohen yep. money, but they, they have the money. Again, we talked about Machado. They have the money. Correct. They're just choosing not to spend it. That's true. But yeah, as a Mets fan going through the Will Pond years and – Always seeing the Yankees about a, a hundred million more than the Mets in payroll. Uh, very happy his Mets fan. So I'm trying to look at it with neutral eyes uh, from a financial standpoint. I mean, dead money as a tax, an estimated tax bill, a hundred million. I mean, that's dreadful. But you cancel it out by having the wealthiest owner in the in the league, bar none. Uh, so that kind of washes for a B. You look at the contracts. I thought Nimmo, again, great player, you know, underrated player. I love Nimmo. He probably got overpaid a little bit. But then you look at Jeff McNeil, absolute steal. Four years, uh, $50 million total for a guy who's a, a batting title uh, winner. Uh, so that kind of cancels out. Verlander, again, that's a lot of money to give a 40-year-old pitcher. But I actually think that mo that money is going to be better spent than DeGrom over five years. I mean, you have more flexibility in the short term with Verlander because he's going to be off the books in two years. You would be stuck in the fourth, fifth year of that DeGrom contract, essentially in a Cano situation where you're getting absolutely nothing out of him. Uh, so I'm very happy right now. I'm canceling all of that out. We have the good and the bad. So I'm going B. All right. So I, I love it that uh, all four of us, well, the two the two pairs were in sync here. Tom and I end up with the Bs for the Yanks, end up with a B average, obviously. And for, for Joe and Corey, B+. Plus, uh, that, it's funny with all those fluctuations in, in the grading there, it still ended up being a B-plus average for, for both. So uh, uh, it's going to be an interesting one for the Yanks and Mets. So it's an offseason that, of course, you know, uh, there is the highest of highs, and then there was, all right, where are you guys uh, been? So uh, we'll, we'll see how this pans out, obviously, for the uh, 2023 season for both New York teams. But uh, for now, uh, we're going to put a close to tonight's episode of the offseason series. And uh, before we let you go, just got a bunch of announcements. So just bear with me here. So obviously, you can follow us on YouTube. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. All our best of clips. Not many of them, but we got a lot of best of clips there. Uh, and uh, all our episodes are up on the YouTube page, and of course, including this one that will be up there later tonight, so make sure to give us a follow on YouTube. Also, we got some cool things coming up for the show, and uh, in our next off-season series episode, which will be in a couple of weeks' time, uh, we're going to have our first ever March Madness tournament live on the show. We have a 16-seed greatest 
baseball movie of all time bracket on our show. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So from the field of dreams to the sandlot, the 61, 42, the natural, we're going to discuss it all and more on that show. The whole 16 seed bracket taking up the entirety of the show, including, and also the world baseball classic, which I mentioned earlier, I alluded to earlier, the world baseball classic, which will be ongoing. We'll be talking about the WBC as well. And, if you make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, which again, brought this up earlier. So make sure to give us a follow on our social medias because for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be revealing our first ever ESP 2023 top 10 rankings of each position in baseball. So from, you know, the, we're going to have some of the insane debates. First base is loaded. Third base is loaded. Outfield is crazy insane. So if you follow us on social media, you're going to follow along on Mondays and Thursdays, starting this Thursday. Of course, we're going to reveal those rankings, starting with the starting pitchers. So starting pitchers will kick it off on Thursday. And last but not least, uh, we're going to wrap up our all-season series. Episode number 39 is going to be on Monday, March the 27th. And we are going to uh, be hyping up the opening day, which will be that week on the 30th. And... Uh, we're going to get into the rankings of the of the outfield live on the show. So that'll be a lot of fun. And we're going to get to our predictions, World Series, MVPs, all that good stuff and more on our show. Plus, we're going to have a lot of changes up and coming for Empire State of Baseball, which I'm going to bring up in the next few weeks. All right. I'm out of breath. So with that, some thank yous around the room, starting with Corey. Uh, listen, I got to thank it. I'm, I'm going to a random sport here right now. I got to thank Kyle Bush for winning me the uh, – my bet in yesterday's NASCAR <laughs> race. Awesome race. That's a shame to get rid of that Fontana two-mile track. Uh, really was a great race yesterday. So thank you, can't Kyle Bush. Kyle Bush. I'm glad you won money, but I can't say it. Thank you for the Devils for giving some excitement to me uh, in the offseason. Went to the game on Saturday. It was a 7 nothing blowout against the Flyers. It was a great uh, day to see. I'm thankful this marathon episode is over. But you're not thankful for your Wi-Fi, I can tell you that. Uh, I'm thankful for Thomas making his return to the show. It's been so long since we've seen you. We're glad to have you back. Uh, and uh, so happy to see, of course, Joe and Corey, as always. Can't wait for another season of Empire State of Baseball. And, of course, the ringing in of the official Major League Baseball season for 2023. Thank you all for participating in our chat tonight. We had a lot of activity. I saw you all. I want to thank you all. I want to hug you all. Thank you so much for being a part of tonight's show. And we hope to see you here in two weeks' time for our next episode, March the 13th, for episode number 38. And until then, take care.